story eleven of a changed man and other tales by thomas hardy this librivox recording is in the public domain story eleven a mere interlude chapters one through four chapter one the traveller in school-books who vouched in driest tones for the fidelity to fact of the following narrative used to add a ring of truth to it by opening with a nicety of criticism on the heroine's personality people were wrong he declared when they surmised that baptista trethen was a young woman with scarcely emotions or character there was nothing in her to love and nothing to hate so ran the general opinion that she showed few positive qualities was true the colours and tones which changing events paint on the faces of active womanhood were looked for in vain upon hers but still waters run deep and no crisis had come in the years of her early maidenhood to demonstrate what lay hidden within her like metal in a mine she was the daughter of a small farmer in st maria's one of the isles of lyonesse beyond off wessex who had spent a large sum as there understood on her education by sending her to the mainland for two years at nineteen she was entered at the training college for teachers and at twenty-one nominated to a school in the country near tor upon sea whither she proceeded after the christmas examination and holidays the months passed by from winter to spring and summer and baptista applied herself to her new duties as best she could till an uneventful year had elapsed then an air of abstraction pervaded her bearing as she walked to and fro twice a day and she showed the traits of a person who had something on her mind a widow by name mrs wace in whose house baptista trethen had been provided with a sitting-room and bedroom till the schoolhouse should be built noticed this change in her youthful tenant's manner and at last ventured to press her with a few questions oh, it has nothing to do with the place nor with you said miss trethen then it is the salary no nor the salary then it is something you have heard from home my dear baptista was silent for a few moments it is mr hedigan she murmured him they used to call david hedigan before he got his money and who is the mr hedigan they used to call david an old bachelor at giant's town st maria's with no relations whatever who lives about a stone's throw from father's when i was a child he used to take me on his knee and say he'd marry me some day now i am a woman the jest has turned earnest and he is anxious to do it and father and mother says i can't do better than have him he's well off oh yes he's the richest man we know as a friend and neighbour how much older did you say he was than yourself i didn't say twenty years at least and an unpleasant man in the bargain perhaps no he's not unpleasant well child all i can say is that i'd resist any such engagement if it's not palatable to ee you are comfortable here in my little house i hope all the parish like ye and i've never been so cheerful since my poor husband left me to wear his wings as i've been with ee as my lodger the schoolmistress assured her landlady that she could return the sentiment but here comes my perplexity she said i don't like keeping school ah you are surprised you didn't suspect it that's because i've concealed my feeling well i simply hate school i don't care for children they are unpleasant troublesome little things whom nothing would delight so much as to hear that you had fallen down dead yet i would even put up with them if it was not for the inspector for three months before his visit i didn't sleep soundly and the committee of council are always changing the code so that you don't know what to teach and what to leave untaught i think father and mother are right they say i shall never excel as a schoolmistress if i dislike the work so and that therefore i ought to get settled by marrying mr hedigan between us two i like him better than school but i don't like him quite so much as to wish to marry him 
these conversations once begun were continued from day to day till at length the young girl's elderly friend and landlady threw in her opinion on the side of miss trethen's parents all things considered she declared the uncertainty of the school the labour baptista's natural dislike for teaching it would be as well to take what fate offered and make the best of matters by wedding her father's old neighbour and prosperous friend the easter holidays came round and baptista went to spend them as usual in her native isle going by train into off wessex and crossing by packet from pin zephyr when she returned in the middle of april her face wore a more settled aspect well said the expectant mrs wace i have agreed to have him as my husband said baptista in an off-hand way heaven knows if it will be for the best or not but i have agreed to do it and so the matter is settled mrs wace commended her but baptista did not care to dwell on the subject so that allusion to it was very infrequent between them nevertheless among other things she repeated to the widow from time to time in monosyllabic remarks that the wedding was really impending that it was arranged for the summer and that she had given notice of leaving the school at the august holidays later on she announced more specifically that her marriage was to take place immediately after her return home at the beginning of the month aforesaid she now corresponded regularly with mr hedigan her letters from him were seen at least on the outside and in part within by mrs wace had she read more of their interiors than the occasional sentences shown her by baptista she would have perceived that the scratchy rusty handwriting of miss trethen's betrothed conveyed little more matter than details of their future housekeeping and his preparations for the same with innumerable my dears sprinkled in disconnectedly to show the depth of his affection without the inconvenience of syntax chapter two it was the end of july dry too dry even for the season the delicate green herbs and vegetables that grew in this favoured end of the kingdom tasting rather of the watering-pot than of the pure fresh moisture from the skies baptista's boxes were packed and one saturday morning she departed by a wagonette to the station and thence by train to pin zephyr from which port she was as usual to cross the water immediately to her home and become mr hedigan's wife on the wednesday of the week following she might have returned a week sooner but though the wedding day had loomed so near and the bands were out she delayed her departure till this last moment saying it was not necessary for her to be at home long beforehand as mr hedigan was older than herself she said she was to be married in her ordinary summer bonnet and grey silk frock and there were no preparations to make that had not been amply made by her parents and intended husband in due time after a hot and tedious journey she reached pin zephyr she here obtained some refreshment and then went towards the pier where she learnt to her surprise that the little steamboat plying between the town and the islands had left at eleven o'clock the usual hour of departure in the afternoon having been forestalled in consequence of the fogs which had for a few days prevailed towards evening making twilight navigation dangerous this being saturday there was now no other boat till tuesday and it became obvious that here she would have to remain for the three days unless her friends should think fit to rig out one of the island sailing-boats and come to fetch her a not very likely contingency the sea distance being nearly forty miles baptista however had been detained in pin zephyr on more than one occasion before either on account of bad weather or some such reason as the present and she was therefore not in any personal alarm but as she was to be married on the following wednesday the delay was certainly inconvenient to a more than ordinary degree since it would leave less than a day's interval between her arrival and the wedding ceremony apart from this awkwardness she did not much mind the accident it was indeed curious to see how little she minded 
perhaps it would not be too much to say that although she was going to do the critical deed of her life quite willingly she experienced an indefinable relief at the postponement of her meeting with hedigan but her manner after making discovery of the hindrance was quiet and subdued even to passivity itself as was instanced by her having at the moment of receiving information that the steamer had sailed replied oh so coolly to the porter with her luggage that he was almost disappointed at her lack of disappointment the question now was should she return again to mrs wace in the village of lower wessex or wait in the town at which she had arrived she would have preferred to go back but the distance was too great moreover having left the place for good and somewhat dramatically to become a bride a return even for so short a space would have been a trifle humiliating leaving then her boxes at the station her next anxiety was to secure a respectable or rather genteel lodging in the popular seaside resort confronting her to this end she looked about the town in which though she had passed through it half a dozen times she was practically a stranger baptista found a room to suit her over a fruiterer's shop where she made herself at home and set herself in order after her journey an early cup of tea having revived her spirits she walked out to reconnoitre being a schoolmistress she avoided looking at the schools and having a sort of trade connection with books she avoided looking at the booksellers but wearying of the other shops she inspected the churches not that for her own part she cared much about ecclesiastical edifices but tourists looked at them and so would she a proceeding for which no one would have credited her with any great originality such for instance as that she subsequently showed herself to possess the churches soon oppressed her she tried the museum but came out because it seemed lonely and tedious yet the town and the walks in this land of strawberries these headquarters of early english flowers and fruit were then as always attractive from the more picturesque streets she went to the town gardens and the pier and the harbour and looked at the men at work there loading and unloading as in the time of the phoenicians not baptista yes baptista it is the words were uttered behind her turning around she gave a start and became confused even agitated for a moment then she said in her usual undemonstrative manner oh is it really you charles without speaking again at once and with a half smile the newcomer glanced her over there was much criticism and some resentment even temper in his eye i am going home continued she but i have missed the boat he scarcely seemed to take in the meaning of this explanation in the intensity of his critical survey teaching still what a fine schoolmistress you make baptista i warrant he said with a slight flavour of sarcasm which was not lost upon her i know i am nothing to brag of she replied that's why i have given up oh given up you astonish me i hate the profession perhaps that's because i am in it no no it isn't but i am going to enter on another life altogether i am going to be married next week to mr david hedigan the young man fortified as he was by a natural cynical pride and passionateness winced at this unexpected reply notwithstanding who is mr david hedigan he asked as indifferently as lay in his power she informed him the bearer of the name was a general merchant of giant's town st maria's island her father's nearest neighbour and oldest friend then we shan't see anything more of you on the mainland inquired the schoolmaster oh i don't know about that said miss trethen here endeth the career of the bell of the boarding-school your father was foolish enough to send you to a general merchant's wife in the lioness isles will you sell pounds of soap and pennyworths of tin tacks or whole bars of saponaceous matter and great tenpenny nails 
he's not in such a small way as that she almost pleaded he owns ships though they are rather little ones oh well it is much the same come let us walk on it is tedious to stand still i thought you would be a failure in education he continued when she obeyed him and strolled ahead you never showed power that way you remind me much of some of those women who think they are sure to be great actresses if they go on the stage because they have a pretty face and forget that what we require is acting but you found your mistake didn't you don't taunt me charles it was noticeable that the young schoolmaster's tone caused her no anger or retaliatory passion far otherwise there was a tear in her eye how is it you are at pen zephyr she inquired i don't taunt you i speak the truth purely in a friendly way as i should to any one i wished well though for that matter i might have some excuse even for taunting you such a terrible hurry as you've been in i hate a woman who is in such a hurry well, how do you mean that why to be somebody's wife or other anything's wife rather than nobody's you couldn't wait for me oh no oh well thank god i'm cured of all that how merciless you are she said bitterly wait for you what does that mean charlie you never showed anything to wait for anything special towards me oh come baptista dear come what i mean is nothing definite she expostulated i suppose you liked me a little but it seemed to me to be only a pastime on your part and that you never meant to make an honourable engagement of it there that's just it you girls expect a man to mean business at the first look no man when he first becomes interested in a woman has any definite scheme of engagement to marry her in his mind unless he is meaning a vulgar mercenary marriage however i did at last mean an honourable engagement as you call it come to that but you never said so and an indefinite courtship soon injures a woman's position and credit sooner than you think baptista i solemnly declare that in six months i should have asked you to marry me she walked along in silence looking on the ground and appearing very uncomfortable presently he said would you have waited for me if you had known to this she whispered in a sorrowful whisper yes they went still farther in silence passing along one of the beautiful walks on the outskirts of the town yet not observant of scene or situation her shoulder and his were close together and he clasped his fingers round the small of her arm quite lightly and without any attempt at impetus yet the act seemed to say now i hold you and my will must be yours recurring to a previous question of hers he said i have merely run down here for a day or two from school near truffel before going off to the north for the rest of my holiday i have seen my relations at redruton quite lately so i am not going there this time how little i thought of meeting you how very different the circumstances would have been if instead of parting again as we must in half an hour or so possibly for ever you had been now just going off with me as my wife on our honeymoon trip ah <laughs> well so humorous is life she stopped suddenly i must go back now this is altogether too painful charlie it is not at all a kind mood you are in to-day i don't want to pain you you know i do not he said more gently only it just exasperates me this you are going to do i wish you would not what marry him there now i have showed you my true sentiments i must do it now said she why he asked dropping the off-hand masterful tone he had hitherto spoken in and becoming earnest still holding her arm however as if she were his chattel to be taken up or put down at will it is never too late to break off a marriage that's distasteful to you now i'll say one thing and it is truth i wish you would marry me instead of him even now at the last moment though you have served me so badly 
oh it is not possible to think of that she answered hastily shaking her head when i get home all will be prepared it is ready even now the things for the party the furniture mr hedigan's new suit and everything i should require the courage of a tropical lion to go home there and say i wouldn't carry out my promise then go in heaven's name but there should be no necessity for you to go home and face them in that way if we were to marry it would have to be at once instantly or not at all i should think your affection not worth the having unless you agreed to come back with me to truffle this evening where we could be married by license on monday morning and then no mr david hedigan or any one else could get you away from me i must go home by the tuesday boat she faltered what would they think if i did not come you could go home by that boat just the same all the difference would be that i should go with you you could leave me on the quay where i'd have a smoke while you went and saw your father and mother privately you could then tell them what you had done and that i was waiting not far off that i was a schoolmaster in a fairly good position and a young man you had known when you were at training college then i would come boldly forward and they would see that it could not be altered and so you wouldn't suffer a lifelong misery by being the wife of a wretched old gaffer you don't like at all now honestly you do like me best don't you baptista yes then we will do as i say she did not pronounce a clear affirmative but that she consented to the novel proposition at some moment or other of that walk was apparent by what occurred a little later chapter three an enterprise of such pith required indeed less talking than consideration the first thing they did in carrying it out was to return to the railway station where baptista took from her luggage a small trunk of immediate necessaries which she would in any case have required after missing the boat that same afternoon they travelled up the line to truffle charles stowe as his name was despite his disdainful indifference to things was very careful of appearances and made the journey independently of her though in the same train he told her where she could get board and lodgings in the city and with merely a distant nod to her of a provisional kind went off to his own quarters and to see about the license on sunday she saw him in the morning across the nave of the pro-cathedral in the afternoon they walked together in the fields where he told her that the license would be ready next day and would be available the day after when the ceremony could be performed as early after eight o'clock as they could choose his courtship thus renewed after an interval of two years was as impetuous violent even as it was short the next day came and passed and the final arrangements were made their agreement was to get the ceremony over as soon as they possibly could the next morning so as to go to pen zephyr at once and reach that place in time for the boat's departure the same day it was in obedience to baptista's earnest request that stowe consented thus to make the whole journey to Leoness by land and water at one heat and not break it at pen zephyr she seemed to be oppressed with a dread of lingering anywhere this great first act of disobedience to her parents once accomplished with the weight on her mind that her home had to be convulsed by the disclosure of it to face her difficulties over the water immediately she had created them was however a course more desired by baptista than by her lover though for once he gave way the next morning was bright and warm as those which had preceded it by six o'clock it seemed nearly noon as is often the case in that part of england in the summer season by nine they were husband and wife they packed up and departed by the earliest train after the service and on the way discussed at length what she should say on meeting her parents charlie dictating the turn of each phrase in her anxiety they had travelled so early that when they reached pen zephyr they found there was nearly two hours on their hands before the steamer's time of sailing 
baptista was extremely reluctant to be seen promenading the streets of the watering-place with her husband till as above stated the household at giant's town should know the unexpected course of events from her own lips and it was just possible if not likely that some leonessian might be prowling about there or even have come across the sea to look for her to meet any one to whom she was known and to have to reply to awkward questions about the strange young man at her side before her well-framed announcement had been delivered at proper time and place was a thing she could not contemplate with equanimity so instead of looking at the shops and harbour they went along the coast a little way the heat of the morning was by this time intense they clambered up on some cliffs and while sitting there looking around at st michael's mount and other objects charles said to her that he thought he would run down to the beach at their feet and take just one plunge into the sea baptista did not much like the idea of being left alone it was gloomy she said but he assured her he would not be gone more than a quarter of an hour at the outside and she passively assented down he went disappeared appeared again and looked back then he again proceeded and vanished till as a small waxen object she saw him emerge from the nook that had screened him across the white fringe of foam and walk into the undulating mass of blue once in the water he seemed less inclined to hurry than before he remained a long time and unable either to appreciate his skill or criticize his want of it at that distance she withdrew her eyes from the spot and gazed at the still outline of st michael's now beautifully toned in grey her anxiety for the hour of departure and to cope at once with the approaching incidents that she would have to manipulate as best she could sent her into a reverie it was now tuesday she would reach home in the evening a very late time they would say but as the delay was a pure accident they would deem her marriage to mr hedigan to-morrow still practicable then charles would have to be produced from the background it was a terrible undertaking to think of and she almost regretted her temerity in wedding so hastily that morning the rage of her father would be so crushing the reproaches of her mother so bitter and perhaps charles would answer hotly and perhaps cause estrangement till death there had obviously been no alarm about her at st maria's or somebody would have sailed across to inquire for her she had in a letter written at the beginning of the week spoken of the hour at which she intended to leave her country schoolhouse and from this her friends had probably perceived that by such timing she would run a risk of losing the saturday boat she had missed it and as a consequence sat there on the shore as mrs charles stowe this brought her to the present and she turned from the outline of st michael's mount to look about for her husband's form he was as far as she could discover no longer in the sea then he was dressing by moving a few steps she could see where his clothes lay but charles was not beside them baptista looked back again at the water in bewilderment as if her senses were the victim of some slate of hand not a speck or spot resembling a man's head or face showed anywhere by this time she was alarmed and her alarm intensified when she perceived a little beyond the scene of her husband's bathing a small area of water the quality of whose surface differed from that of the surrounding expanse as the coarse vegetation of some foul patch in a mead differs from the fine green of the remainder elsewhere it looked flexuous here it looked vermiculated and lumpy and her marine experiences suggested to her in a moment that two currents met and caused a turmoil at this place she descended as hastily as her trembling limbs would allow the way down was terribly long and before reaching the heap of clothes it occurred to her that after all it would be best to run first for help hastening along in a lateral direction she proceeded inland till she met a man and soon afterwards two others to them she exclaimed i think a gentleman who was bathing is in some danger i cannot see him as i could will you please run and help him at once if you will be so kind 
she did not think of turning to show them the exact spot indicating it vaguely by the direction of her hand and still going on her way with the idea of gaining more assistance when she deemed in her faintness that she had carried the alarm far enough she faced about and dragged herself back again before reaching the now dreaded spot she met one of the men we can see nothing at all miss he declared having gained the beach she found the tide in and no sign of charlie's clothes the other men whom she had besought to come had disappeared it must have been in some other direction for she had not met them going away they finding nothing had probably thought her alarm a mere conjecture and given up the quest baptista sank down upon the stones near at hand where charlie had undressed was now sea there could not be the least doubt that he was drowned and his body sucked under by the current while his clothes lying within high water mark had probably been carried away by the rising tide she remained in a stupor for some minutes till a strange sensation succeeded the aforesaid perceptions mystifying her intelligence and leaving her physically almost inert with his personal disappearance the last three days of her life with him seemed to be swallowed up also his image in her mind's eye waned curiously receded far away grew stranger and stranger less and less real their meeting and marriage had been so sudden unpremeditated adventurous that she could hardly believe that she had played her part in such a reckless drama of all the few hours of her life with charles the portion that most insisted on coming back to memory was their fortuitous encounter on the previous saturday and those bitter reprimands with which he had begun the attack as it might be called which had piqued her to an unexpected consummation a sort of cruelty an imperiousness even in his warmth had characterized charles stowe as a lover he had ever been a bit of a tyrant and it might pretty truly have been said that he had stung her into marriage with him at last still more alien from her life did these reflections operate to make him and then they would be chased away by an interval of passionate weeping and mad regret finally there returned upon the confused mind of the young wife the recollection that she was on her way homeward and that the packet would sail in three-quarters of an hour except the parasol in her hand all she possessed was at the station awaiting her onward journey she looked in that direction and entering one of those undemonstrative phases so common with her walked quietly on at first she made straight for the railway but suddenly turning she went to a shop and wrote an anonymous line announcing his death by drowning to the only person she had ever heard charles mention as a relative posting this stealthily and with a fearful look around her she seemed to acquire a terror of the late events pursuing her way to the station as if followed by a spectre when she got to the office she asked for the luggage that she had left there on the saturday as well as the trunk left on the morning just lapsed all were put in the boat and she herself followed quickly as these things had been done the whole proceeding nevertheless had been almost automatic on baptista's part ere she had come to any definite conclusion on her course just before the bell rang she heard a conversation on the pier which removed the last shade of doubt from her mind if any had existed that she was charles stowe's widow the sentences were but fragmentary but she could easily piece them out a man drowned swam out too far was a stranger to the place people in the boat saw him go down couldn't get there in time the news was little more definite than this as yet though it may as well be stated once for all that the statement was true charlie with the overconfidence of his nature had ventured out too far for his strength and succumbed in the absence of assistance his lifeless body being at that moment suspended in the transparent mid-depths of the bay his clothes, however, had merely been gently lifted by the rising tide, and floated into a nook hard by, where they lay out of sight of the passers-by, till a day or two later. CHAPTER Four. 
in ten minutes they were steaming out of the harbour for their voyage of four or five hours at whose ending she would have to tell her strange story as pin zephyr and all its environing scenes disappeared behind mousehole and st clement's isle baptista's ephemeral meteor-like husband impressed her yet more as a fantasy she was still in such a trance-like state that she had been an hour on the little packet-boat before she became aware of the agitating fact that mr hedigan was on board with her involuntarily she slipped from her left hand the symbol of her wifehood he he well the truth is i wouldn't interrupt ye i reckon she don't see me or won't see me i said ah, what's the hurry she'll see enough of me soon i hope you be well me dear he was a hale well-conditioned man of about five and fifty of the complexion common to those whose lives are passed on the bluffs and beaches of an ocean isle he extended the four quarters of his face in a genial smile and his hand for a grasp of the same magnitude she gave her own in surprised docility and he continued i couldn't help coming across to meet ye. what an unfortunate thing you missing the boat and not coming saturday they meant to have warned ye that the time was changed but forgot it at the last moment the truth is that i should have informed ye myself but i was that busy finishing up a job last week so as to have this week free that i trusted to your father for attending to these little things however so plain and quiet as it is all to be it really do not matter so much as it might otherwise have done and i hope you haven't been greatly put out now if you'd sooner that i should not be seen talking to ee if he feels shy at all before strangers just say i'll leave ee you to yourself till we get home oh thank you much i am indeed a little tired mr hedigan he nodded urbane acquiescence strolled away immediately and minutely inspected the surface of the funnel till some female passengers of giant's town tittered at what they must have thought a rebuff for the approaching wedding was known to many on st maria's island though to nobody elsewhere baptista coloured at their satire and called him back and forced herself to commune with him in at least a mechanically friendly manner the opening event had been thus different from her expectation and she had adumbrated no act to meet it taken aback she passively allowed circumstances to pilot her along and so the voyage was made it was near dusk when they touched the pier of giant's town where several friends and neighbours stood waiting them her father had a lantern in his hand her mother too was there reproachfully glad that the delay had at last ended so simply mrs trethen and her daughter went together along the giant's walk or promenade to the house rather in advance of her husband and mr hedigan who talked in loud tones which reached the women over their shoulders some would have called mrs trethen a good mother but though well-meaning she was maladroit and her intentions missed their mark this might have been partly attributable to the slight deafness from which she suffered now as usual the chief utterances came from her lips oh yes i'm so glad my child that you've got over safe it is all ready and everything so well arranged that nothing but misfortune could hinder you settling as with god's grace becomes ye close to your mother's door a'most twill be a great blessing i'm sure and i was very glad to find from your letters that you'd held your word sacred that's right make your word your bond always mrs wace seems to be a sensible woman i hope the lord will do for her as he's doing for you no long time hence and how did he get over the terrible journey from tor upon sea to pen zephyr once you'd done with the railway of course you seemed quite at home well baptista conduct yourself seemly and all will be well thus admonished baptista entered the house her father and mr hedigan immediately at her back her mother had been so didactic that she had felt herself absolutely unable to broach the subjects in the centre of her mind the familiar room with the dark ceiling the well-spread table the old chairs had never before spoken so eloquently of the times ere she knew or had heard of charlie stowe 
she went upstairs to take off her things her mother remaining below to complete the disposition of the supper and attend to the preparation of to-morrow's meal altogether composing such an array of pies from pies of fish to pies of turnips as was never heard of outside the western duchy baptista once alone sat down and did nothing and was called before she had taken off her bonnet i'm coming she cried jumping up and speedily disapparelling herself brushed her hair with a few touches and went down two or three of mr heddegan's and her father's friends had dropped in and expressed their sympathy for the delay she had been subjected to the meal was a most merry one except to baptista she had desired privacy and there was none and to break the news was already a greater difficulty than it had been at first everything around her animate and inanimate great and small insisted that she had come home to be married and she could not get a chance to say nay one or two people sang songs as overtures to the melody of the morrow till at length bedtime came and they all withdrew her mother having retired a little earlier when baptista found herself again alone in her bedroom the case stood as before she had come home with much to say and she had said nothing it was now growing clear even to herself that charles being dead she had not determination sufficient within her to break tidings which had he been alive would have imperatively announced themselves and thus with the stroke of midnight came the turning of the scale her story should remain untold it was not that upon the whole she thought it best not to attempt to tell it but that she could not undertake so explosive a matter to stop the wedding now would cause a convulsion in giant's town little short of volcanic weakened tired and terrified as she had been by the day's adventures she could not make herself the author of such a catastrophe but how refuse hedigan without telling it really seemed to her as if her marriage with mr hedigan were about to take place as if nothing had intervened morning came the events of the previous days were cut off from her present existence by scene and sentiment more completely than ever charles stowe had grown to be a special being of whom owing to his character she entertained rather fearful than loving memory baptista could hear when she awoke that her parents were already moving about downstairs but she did not rise till her mother's rather rough voice resounded up the staircase as it had done on the preceding evening baptista come time to be stirring the man will be here by heaven's blessing in three-quarters of an hour he has looked in already for a minute or two and he says he's going to the church to see if things be well forward baptista arose looked out of the window and took the easy course when she emerged from the regions above she was arrayed in her new silk frock and best stockings wearing a linen jacket over the former for breakfasting and her common slippers over the latter not to spoil the new ones on the rough precincts of the dwelling it is unnecessary to dwell at any great length on this part of the morning's proceedings she revealed nothing and married hedigan as she had given her word to do on that appointed august day end of story 11 chapters 1 through 4